الحمد لله رب العالمين صلى الله وسلم وبارك على محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين so it's clear that um, it's going to take maybe a couple of weeks for the adjustment of the time to uh, <laughs> to be made and uh, so we're probably going to have like a lot of stragglers wa alaykum assalam wa rahmatullah and uh, that's unfortunate because uh, the time will continue to go uh, backwards, which means we'll probably have to continue to move the time uh, every other week uh, to make sure we have uh, 45 minutes to an hour for our discussion. But uh, as you all know, the last few weeks we have, uh, we started out, I'm sorry, our series of discussions, we started out with the topic, how do we get here? And those discussions, they centered around the events that took place between our father Adam, our mother Hawa, and a shaitan, and how those events or the lessons that we can take from those events and how those events are basically a microcosm of what we deal with every day and the manipulations of the shaitan, etc. Then after thoroughly discussing that topic, we transitioned to the topic of how the shaitan practices his enmity against Adam and his progeny. And again, we spent a good amount of time discussing that. And it was my intention tonight to begin having a new, highly important <clears throat> discussion, highly important and much needed discussion about achieving Muslim unity and fostering a cohesive Muslim community. And I was hoping that we would begin a text study of some of the important ayat from Surah Al Hujurat, which is a surah in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala counsels the Muslim community on how to achieve unity and foster a sense of community. But that discussion will have to wait because the Imam has asked me to speak tonight and next week about a subject near and dear to his heart, a da'wah ilallah azza Islamic evangelism or calling to Allah. And this discussion we're going to divide into two parts and tonight we'll be discussing the following points. Number one, what is da'wah? And what does it mean to call to Allah? Number two, what is ruh, ruh da'wah? The spirit of da'wah in its lifeblood. Number three, what is the incentive to engage in da'wah? And why should we care about doing it? And number four, last but not least, who should do da'wah? And what does this discussion have to do with us? You know, the common people, the laymen, why are we having this discussion? Should we understand from it that we are also expected or we have a role in doing da'wah? So what is a da'wah? And what does it mean to call to Allah? A da'wah linguistically, in the language of the Arabs, is derived from the verb da'a, Yadu, which means to invoke, to call, to summon. And in this context, the context in which we'll be, speak, we'll be speaking, a da'wah, more specifically, it means a nida li jami' al nas ala amr al ma' wa hathuhum al amri lahu. So basically, when we talk about Dao in the context we'll be speaking tonight, linguistically, it means an invitation to people at large towards a specific matter and encouraging them to work for its sake. So this is what it means, generally speaking, in the language when you say, I called some people, I invited some people. It means what? You call them to what? To a specific matter. And you call them to be concerned with it, to be attentive to it. That's basically what it means in the language to da'a yadu, right? But Islamically, when we talk about Islamically, 
then a dua, a dawa. Some of the people have, or some of the scholars have defined it as al bayan wa tabliq li had al din, usulan wa arkanum wa takalifa wa al hathu alayhi wa tarqibu fi. So basically, the scholars of Islam, when they talk about Islam from, I'm sorry, a dua or a dawa from an Islamic perspective. They're talking about clarifying and conveying this religion. Its theology, its rites and rituals, its commandments, the do's and don'ts of the deen. And encouraging people toward embracing it and otherwise promoting it. So whatever we do to promote Islam, and whenever we are inviting people to Islam or clarifying what Islam is to people, that is called da'wah. And this da'wah, since it is clarifying the deen and promoting it and inviting people to embrace it, then that would encompass both non-Muslims, who are the primary target, but also encompasses who? Muslims as well. Can you give da'wah to a Muslim? Yes. Yeah, you can give da'wah to a Muslim because it's clarifying, encouraging a person to embrace, promoting Islam. You can give da'wah to a non-Muslim, I'm sorry, to a, to a Muslim. And we have to acknowledge that sometimes, you know, we have to acknowledge that sometimes Muslims, the room isn't, I, I never got a, an invite. Huh? I need to open. All right, let me get out. All right, let me get out and get back in. One second. <clears throat> All right, you guys here now? Yes, yeah, sorry about that. I forgot we started at seven. My apologies. <clears throat> so, as I was saying, that this da'wah, given the definition that we gave. It encompasses Muslims and non-Muslims. You can give da'wah to a Muslim. And although non-Muslims are primarily the target of da'wah, you can also give, and sometimes Muslims are even more in need of da'wah than the non-Muslims. And I'll give you an example. Recently, somebody they showed me a video of some people who belong to the Shia Medheb, from a particular country and this person was going around to them and interviewing them and he basically said that because he was interviewing at the time where the people go to the shrine of Al Hussein so he was interviewing at this time where people go to the shrine and what they do at the shrine is they circumbobulate it they go around it in circles like, they, like, like we do the Kaaba they make oaths there they make prayer there, they make sajda there, etc. So this person was going around and interviewing people who are not there and telling them that basically I have an Imam Hussein, I have him on the phone. And I'm calling him or I'm connected to the shrine and you will be able to hear when you come on the, the line, you will be able to hear the people in the background, who are at the shrine visiting Hussein, and I'm going to give you this opportunity to say to talk to Al Imam Al Hussein and say whatever you want to say. And these people would actually give them a lot, and they would say things like like this. They said, for example, and ta'alu bil qulub. They would say, Yeah, and yeah, Imam Al Hussein, you are more knowledgeable of the hearts. They would say things like Ishfi kulla marib. Oh, Hussein, cure every sick person. Oh Hussein, Um Surjeshana, give victory to our army. Nuridu Shafa'atak, we want your intercession. Irham al Iraq wal Iraqiin. Hussein, have mercy upon Al Iraq and the people of the Iraq. They will make these dua and they say they're, they're calling on him, talking to him as if they're talking to what? Somebody like you and me call somebody and talk to them on the phone. I mention this example to say that most of us who, if we see this, we're saying, man, what is wrong with these people? 
they have to know that Al Hussein is not on the other end of this line. But somehow they convince themselves and they make themselves believe that yes, he is. He's actually on the other end of the line and they're talking to him as if they were talking to you or me. And this is something that non Muslims, many of them, would say is what? Well. It's foolish. It doesn't make sense. And so in this case, these people who are Muslims, you know, in parentheses, are more in need of what? Of a da'wah than what? Than some? Non-Muslims. You guys see what I'm saying? I'm trying to say? So I, I say all that to drive the point home that a da'wah yeshman, or yeah, a da'wah tashman, it encompasses, it includes, and it's supposed to be directed to both the Muslims and the non-Muslims. Even though non-Muslims are the primary target. When we think of da'wah, we think of giving, calling and inviting non-Muslims to, to Islam. Another point that's really important to make about this whole concept of calling to Allah. Calling to Allah, we have to understand what that means, practically speaking. And I think a lot of Muslims, they lose sight of that, and I'm going to give you some examples to show that. Calling to Allah, it means calling people to Him, not to ourselves. And uh, one of the imams wrote a very good book, and in that book he mentioned a chapter about a, he called it the da'wah to the tawheed, calling and inviting to the oneness of Allah. And he mentioned some ayat, and then after that he mentioned some fawa'id, the benefits of the ayat that he mentioned. He said one of the benefits was a da'wah to ilallah. فَكَمْ مِمَّنْ يَدْعُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ وَفِي حَقِيقَةِ الْأَمْرِ يَدْعُوا إِلَى نَفْسِهِ He said the chapter or the ayat that teaches that we should call to Allah because how many people claim to call to Allah, but in reality they call to to themselves. And how can you pick up on this? How can you know this? You know this because they have a tendency in their lectures and their talks where they're supposed to be calling to Allah. Preaching the deen. It's a lot of what? Me, 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 me. My platform, my this, my that. They're, they're calling you to join something that they have produced. Join a program that they're going to put on. And scarcely do you hear in the talk Allah, Allah said. Qala Rasulullah, the Messenger of Allah said. I ask you honestly, if you're calling to Allah and His Messenger and you're not mentioning Allah, you're not mentioning the Messenger of Allah, you're not saying what Allah said or His Messenger said, in reality, who are you calling to? Especially if, if you're saying, me, 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 me. Who are you really calling to? This is not a da'wah, ya Allah. Even the Prophet ﷺ, he talked about the people who work he, he, he gave this like symbolism, describing the people who really work for Allah's sake. So he said, he said, he said, Fadl alimi al abid. Kafadli al qamar layat al badri ala sa'ir al kawakib. He said, the superiority of the scholar, the one who calls to Allah. Over the common worshiper is the superiority, the likeness of that superiority is the likeness of the superiority of the moon when it's at the full over the rest of the stars. And you guys know, you go out on a night of the full moon and you have to like really, you have to really squint your eyes to see what? The stars. So the Prophet gives this analogy, but I want, you, I want to ask you a question. Isn't the sun even more bright and more diminishing or muting of the stars than the moon? Isn't it? Can you, when the sun is out, do you see the stars? No, no evident. So why didn't the Prophet say, Ashams? Why didn't he say the sun? Because the Prophet wants to teach us something about the people who really call to Allah. Because what is the relationship between the sun and the moon? Does the moon have light of its own? Does the moon have light of its own? No, it gets its light from what? It's a reflection. It's, it's, it's a reflector. It takes light from the sun and reflects it. That's what the moon does. It doesn't have any light of its own. But the sun has what? It has its own light. It's a source of light. And so basically, the Prophet is teaching us a roundabout way that the people who really call to Allah, they don't call to what? 
themselves. They don't say me, 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 me. But they're like what? They just transfer the light of who? Of Allah. The light of what Allah said and His Messenger said. That's what they do. And that's how you're going to know the people who really call to Allah. And this is what it means to call to Allah. It means really to call to Allah. Not to call to yourself. Me, 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 me. You know what Allah said? And His Messenger Not to make it about you. Not to make everything centered around you. Everything has to come back to me. No. It's all about Allah. It's all about the work. It's all about doing Allah's work. Calling people to Allah, calling people to follow His Messenger, etc. It also means to believe, calling people to believe in the aqidah, the theology and the principles of faith that Allah has prescribed, not in an aqidah of our own making, or that suits our fancies. And you see this a lot nowadays. People develop these philosophies, or they adopt Western philosophies, and then they just put what? Islam in front of it. So for example, you have something called Islamic feminism. feminism. Islamic feminism. You guys ever heard that before? You actually have people, females, who are now opening their own masajid. Female-only mosques. You have speakers who come, come to platforms. They, they come out and say, I'm, an, I'm a Muslim feminist. Right? I believe in Islamic feminism. They create a philosophy. They take a philosophy. They manipulate it. They put the word Islam in front of it or Islamic. And then all of a sudden, you got something what? New. And they're calling to it, inviting people to it. To the point that we got an email this summer inviting us to attend a symposium where they were basically talking about, uh, what was it? It was called Empower Her. Empower Her. You guys know Empower. Well, they just stuck what? An H, Empower Her. Basically saying, and then they had, a, they had the, the subtitle basically saying, you know, what does Islam say about feminism or talking about Islamic, Islamic feminism? So I say that to say that there are people who call to what? These new theologies and philosophies which have nothing to do with Islam, but they just call it Islam. Are they giving da'wah? No, not to, not to Allah. They say they're calling to Allah, but in reality they're calling to what? They're calling to themselves or calling to a, a religion which is foreign to Islam. Even if they call it Islamic. The Badanic calling to Allah, it means calling people to follow His way, not our way or a way of our own making. I'll give an example of that. Recently, I was having a discussion with a brother, I know him. Uh, and this brother uh, is um, someone who works in the field of Al Imamah. You know, being an imam, someone who leads communities, someone who uh, teaches, preaches, leads the prayers, etc. And he was speaking with a group of people, or one representative, a group of people who are in charge of a community or a budding community. And he was talking about him. He was talking to him about the, the potential of employment with their organization, their budding organization. And so that person he was speaking to, he said to him, he said, because the person who's asking him is African American. And I want to make this point uh, before I mention what he told him. He said, or the point is, is that this African American imam is someone who beyond being, what it say, beyond being trained in the Islamic studies, beyond being someone who has memorized Quran, beyond being someone who, um, is very well trained in the sciences of deen. Beyond that, he's also someone who is trained in the field of education, someone who has taught uh, languages, someone who has the skills and the ability to event plan, to make programs, very competent and skilled in this area, and has had success al Muhim, he has all of this going for him, and the guy, and he tells, and he basically is asking the guy about employment, and the guy says, the brother says, he says, yeah, I don't think that uh, you would be considered for employment with us because you're not Daisy. You know what Daisy means? No. You know what Daisy means? No. Daisy is a common word that's used to refer to people from the Indo-Pak subcontinent or Bangladesh. They're born there, 
they're from there and they migrated and they live abroad. So for example, they may live in Canada, they may live in the US, they may live in the UK. They're called what? Desis. Indo-Pak subcontinent, Bangladesh, living abroad. Desis. So basically this guy was Desis. And he said, yeah, you know, your credentials, your qualifications are impeccable. But you wouldn't have a place with us because you're not Desi. We would hire someone who was less qualified than you because they were Desi. I'm asking you honestly, and you can correct me if I'm wrong. I'm asking you, the people who are building a masjid, a place where Allah is going to be worshipped, and are claiming to call to Allah, say to a person who is exceptionally qualified, you can't be hired because of your ethnicity. You're the wrong ethnicity. Are they calling to Allah? They're calling to what? Their own way. The Desi way. They're calling to Desiism. They're calling to ethnic prejudice, which is what? Jahiliyyah. It's the opposite of Islam. And they should, and this is the thing, the person said it with no fear. They didn't feel uncomfortable that we're basically playing with the deen of Allah. They didn't feel that sense of, man, how can I even be comfortable mouthing these words and not fear that everything we're trying to do, not only will it not be blessed by Allah, it may be something punishable by Allah. Because we're not doing it Allah's like because when you talk about imama, it's supposed to be a meritocracy. It's supposed to be about what you've learned and what you can do, not about where you come from and how you look. But that's how people make it. The Prophet ﷺ, there was a group of people, he had taught them about the prayer. They were visiting and they were going to go back to their, their land. And so he told them, he gave them some instructions about the prayer beyond what he would already taught them. And he said, when the time for prayer comes, then let one of you give the adhan, and then let the person who is most knowledgeable of the Qur'an lead you in prayer. Be your imam. Another hadith, he said, the person should be the imam who knows the most Qur'an. If two people are equal in that, the one who knows the most of the sunnah. If two people are equal in that, the first one to make hijrah. If two people are equal in, that, equal in that, and he goes on, what? Meritocracy. Never mention what? Race, ethnicity. But this person mentioned it. This is not Allah's way. And many people, and that just goes to show you this, and think about this too, these are the religious people. The religious people, the people who should know better and act better and be better, are saying these things and saying it comfortably. I'm comfortable telling you there's no place for you here just because of how you look, just because of your ethnicity. I'm comfortable with that. This is not Allah's way. People are calling to what? To other than Allah's way and then fooling themselves to think they're calling to Allah's way. And that goes back to what we've been talking about over the last few weeks about how the shaitan just deceives us. And we don't even realize we've been, we've been had. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about this, uh, this issue of calling to Allah. He says, قُلْ هَذِهِ سَبِيلِي أَدْعُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ عَلَى بَصِيرَةٍ أَنَا وَمَنْ اتَّبَعَنِي وَسُبْحَانَ اللَّهِ وَمَا أَنَا الْمُشْرِكِينَ Say, O Muhammad, to the people, this is my way I invite unto Allah. I call to Allah. I don't call to myself. I don't call to an aqeed of my own making. I don't call to my way. I call to Allah's way. I do this with clear vision, based upon knowledge of what Allah's way is, which is another thing too. Why are these people leading masajid? They're irreligious, and they don't have knowledge. And you know you don't have knowledge if you can comfortably say you can't be hired because you're daisy. When the Prophet said about this same thing, da'uha fa'innaha muntina. Leave this because it what? It's funky. It smells bad. Then he called it jahiliyyah. A da'wah, a da'wah, I said da'ah, a da'wah to jahiliyyah wa'ana bayna adhkurikum. Are you going to actually go back and say the things that the people of jahiliyyah said and I'm amongst you? And muhim, I do this with clear vision. I do this, and likewise, those who follow me. The people who really call to Allah, they call to Allah, just like I do. My real followers, they call to Allah. They don't call to themselves, they don't call to their ethnicity, they don't call to an aqeed of their own making, etc. Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, A da'wah to Allah, he a da'wah to il-iman bihi, wa bima ja'at bihi rusulu. 
وبتصديقهم فيما اخبروا فيما اخبروا به وطاعتهم فيما امروا he said calling to allah means inviting people to believe in him and to believe in what his messenger taught and affirming all that they informed of and obeying all they commanded this is what we call to this is what it means to call to allah you call on people to believe in allah not to believe in you you call people to believe in what the messenger taught means you got to be saying qala rasulullah the messenger said the messenger said how are you going to teach people what the messenger taught and you never mention the messenger you never point to him you never quote a hadith it also means calling people to affirm everything the messengers uh, um, to confirm everything they informed of prophet says that the hellfire is dark says that there are angels and this is this is their size i'm not angels but uh, yeah angels who are over the hellfire this is their size this is what they look like this is their appearance this is what they do to the people in hellfire we never seen that before but we believe in it because the prophet informed of it prophet says on the judgment there's going to be a scale a scale with a tongue that speaks never seen that like that before but we believe in it because the prophet said so they believe in everything the messengers informed even things they haven't seen they can't fathom and he said that they believe or they they, they call them to obey all the messengers commanded this is what it means to call to allah the prophet says we do we don't say yeah the prophet said that but that's old fashioned that was then this is now we don't do that we call to what tell the people to do what the prophet prophet said to do and to obey him but soon by that and I just want to say one other thing one other, one other point I just want to make this for a point because that that daisy thing it really did annoy me and I think you can you can it, it, my, my annoyance is palpable but I just want to say that person will say because the way that he it was it, it, the way that he came off was yeah you know I don't necessarily agree with it but you know that's just how it is what what what, what can I do my hands are tied no your hands aren't tied your hands aren't tied you don't have to fool with people who are on the wrong path. You don't have to go down the wrong path with them. And the prophet told us to use our relationships. If that's the last resort, use our relationships to let people know that we're not feeling, we're not approving of what they're doing. Said in the hadith of Isaid, "Man ra'a minkum munkaran fayughayyiru biyadi." Whoever amongst you sees an evil and change it with his hands, fa lam yastati' fa bi lisani. If you can't do that with his tongue, tell people this is wrong. فَلَمْ يَسْتَطِعْ فَبِقَلْبِ If he can't do that with his قلب What does قلب mean here? It means you get away from them folks I ain't doing that, that's what y'all about? You got a qualified imam here, you're gonna reject him because of his ethnicity? Oh no, I'm not gonna be part of that You see what I'm saying? But people will roll with it and convince themselves that oh, you know, it's, you know No, you're calling to yourself, you're calling to a way other than the way of Allah And this is gonna end in disaster, if not in this world, in the hereafter there's going to be a price to pay. There's going to be questions you won't have to answer. But if about that, if we said, we asked the question, what is Ruh al-Dawah? What is the spirit of a Dawah? What is its lifeblood? Brothers, this is compassion. This is the engine that drives a Dawah. Compassion. In order for a person to be motivated, for them to be committed, to be effective at giving Dawah, he or she must genuinely care about the people being invited genuinely desire to see them guided and genuinely be heartbroken and full of pity due to their ignorance of truth and their misguidance it disturbs him to see people misguided you can you when he speaks you can tell this person cares not like i'm indifferent whatever they got it alhamdulillah they not got it alhamdulillah who cares that's their problem that attitude that person can't they can't call to Allah. They can't make the sacrifices to, to call to Allah. They can't take the abuse that the people who call to Allah take and keep on what? Keep on trudging forward. Unless they have what? Compassion. Like the Prophet had. There's no question, there can be no question in anybody's mind, brothers and sisters. One of the primary qualities that made the Prophet ﷺ such an effective caller, the most effective caller, was the tre tremendous amount of compassion he possessed for people. And you see it in the uh, you see it in the Quran, you see it in the Sunnah, and you see it in his life, in his life story. So in the Quran, for example, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about the Prophet, 
Harisun alaykum bil mu'minina raufur rahim. This is about the Prophet ﷺ. Indeed, there has come to you a messenger from yourselves. It grieves him that you should suffer. It grieves him that a thorn should prick your finger. It grieves him that, it, it, it grieves him that you should suffer in this world, let alone in the hereafter. He, ta he talked about himself in one of the hadith. He talked about himself. He said, I'm like that guy who made a fire. And a bunch of moths came attracted to the light. But when they get too close to the fire, they burn. I'm that guy who's what? Trying to fan the moths away so they don't burn up. That's the likeness of me and you. Just compassion. It grieves him that you should suffer. He is anxious for your guidance. And he is toward the believers kind and compassionate. Allah says in the other ayah from Surah Al-Kahf, He says, فَلَعَلَّكَ بَاخِعُ النَّفْسَكَ عَلَىٰ آثَارِهِمْ إِنْ لَمْ يُؤْمِنُوا بِهَذَا الْحَدِيثِ أَسَفَا Says, it's as if, O Muhammad, you're about to fret yourself to death in grief following after them. So that they'll what? So that they'll believe. So that they'll believe. You're about to fret yourself to death because what if these people don't believe? What's going to happen to them? I don't want that to happen to them. And on, on the plane of Uhud, you guys know the story. You know what happened to the Prophet at Uhud? At Uhud, the Prophet was surrounded by the enemy and a small, and there was with him a small band of the Ansar. And in short order, the enemies of Islam, they decimated the Ansar. So it was basically the Prophet, a couple of Muhajirin, and these people who meant him harm. They beat him about the face. He had this milfar, he had this metal helmet. And the metal helmet that he had had these like two side shields to, to protect his cheeks. They beat him so bad that the, the helmet became bent and part of it pierced his cheek. His face became bloody and he became disoriented. He was pushed into a trap, a ditch that was built as a, as a type of uh, strategy of war. He was pushed into that ditch. He was beaten so bad about the face that they broke his incisor, one of his teeth. And then, at the last minute, by Allah's permission, additional reinforcements came, they pushed back the enemy, and his life was spared. After all of this happened, the Prophet was there on the plain of Uhud, beaten, bruised, bloodied, tooth broken. I'm going to ask you honestly, if that happened to any one of us, would we have prayed for our enemies? No, we wouldn't have done that. Come on, let's just, let's just be honest. Come on, somebody step on your brand new Nikes and you pray against them. Oh, you scuffed up my shoe. May Allah curse you. You know, people do that. <laughs> but you know what the Prophet did? He raised his hands and he said, Allah, Allahumma for no. He said, Oh Allah, forgive my people because they don't know any better. Don't punish them. Forgive them. And when him, I say all this to say that you can't call people if you don't care for them, if you don't care about them, or if you're indifferent towards their well-being and their success, you can't, you can't call them. And this is what frustrates me with the relationship between imams and their communities. And I get complaints about this all the time from other communities and people call me and they ask me about this, that, and the third. And sometimes I, I ask the question, well, don't you guys have a man, imam there? And the person says, yeah, but imam, he doesn't ask, answer questions. He doesn't make time for counseling. He doesn't give classes and programs. <clears throat> and he won't help converts if they've lost their way and they're trying to find their way back. I'm asking you honestly, if you don't have compassion for these people, and part of it, the, the, the lack of compassion is because of the lack of empathy. You don't know what it's like to have not been a Muslim. And the struggle once you become a Muslim and need Encouragement. Need somebody to be the win in your sails. Need somebody to remind you and put you on the straight path. And when you deviate, to put you back on the straight path and be patient with you. You don't know what that's like. So I say all that to say is that these people who don't have compassion, they get to a point where they're bitter. And they have bitterness and acrimony towards the people they're supposed to care about. They can't, they can't give da'wah. And so the engine that drives this da'wah and our ability to be effective at what we're doing, calling to Allah, is compassion. You have to give it down.
طيب ثم بعد ذلك what is the incentive طيب why should I even care about doing da'wah why is this subject even important I'm going to give you a few just a few tip of the iceberg because it's something which the fadl the virtue of it has been mentioned repeatedly in the Quran and the hadith but I'm going to give you a few just nuggets to show you why this is something we should care about as a community one the person who gives da'wah in the eyes of Allah is the best of people Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَوْلًا مِمَّنْ دَعَيْنَ اللَّهِ and who is better in speech who is superior to the one who calls to Allah another reason why it's virtuous another incentive is that when we do da'wah we not only clean up ourselves and rectify ourselves we rectify others we rectify what? our environment we make our environment better <coughs> Come on, man, if all of Colombia convert to Islam tomorrow, what would, Islam, what, what, what would Colombia be like? Y'all see what I'm saying? There would be no bars, there would be no discos, there would be no, you know, bad things going on, because everybody would be Muslim. So this work allows the mujtama, the environment, the society to be cleaned up. There's virtue in that. But from Ba'adhanik, another benefit or incentive is we establish the proof against the people. We, we, we let them know what it is and give them the option. We also free ourselves of guilt and blame with Allah on the Day of Judgment. Allah is going to ask us. And some of these people who we work with and we go to school with and we're neighbors with that we didn't tell them nothing about Islam, they're going to, they're going to blame us. They're going to say, oh, I'm, I'm, I didn't know nothing. This person lived right next door and never told me. They're going to blame you. How do you free yourself of being blamed by them and held accountable by Allah? By telling them about the truth. You save your own skin and you might even save their skin. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-A'raf, He says, وَقَالَتْ أُمَّةٌ مِّنْهُمْ لِمَا تَعِذُونَ قَوْمٍ اللَّهُ مُهْلِكُهُمْ أَوْ مُعَذِّبُهُمْ عَذَابًا شَدِيدًا قَالُوا مَغْفِرَةً إِلَّا رَبِّكُمْ وَلَعَلَّهُمْ يَتَّقُونَ he said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and some people from amongst them, they said, why are you admonishing? Why are you calling? Why are you inviting people who Allah is going to punish them? Because oh, look at all the bad they do. Allah is going to punish them. Or he's going to what? He's going to either punish them in this world or in the hereafter. So the person responded, or the people responded, they said, we won't have an excuse with Allah. We did our part of Allah. They just didn't listen. And maybe they'll what? They'll get guided. Maybe they'll, 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 they will listen. They will be guided. But so another incentive to make this, to do this da'wah, is that for the one who does da'wah will get al-ajr al-mustamir. They'll get this continuous and perpetual reward from Allah. Don't you want that while you're lying in your bed, you're getting reward from Allah? Don't you want that? Don't you want that once you pass from this earth, you get what? Reward from Allah? We all want that. We all want to get something for nothing, right? Tayyip, one of the ways we can do that is by giving da'wah. Prophet said in the hadith, he said, Man da'a ila huda, kan lahum al ajr, mithla ujuri man tabi'ahu la yankusu dhalika min ujurihim shay'a. He said, whoever calls to guidance will get a reward follows it. And that will not decrease the reward of either one of them in anything. Which means if I go out here right now and I meet with a non-Muslim, tell them about Islam, they convert to Islam. I teach them how to pray. And they pray. Every time they pray, I get what? I get the reward and they get the reward. I don't take the reward, but I get the same reward that they that they get. You guys know that every time you recite a letter of the Quran, you get what? One hasana, wal hasan to the and thariha. And a hasana will be multiplied up to ten times. And then the Prophet said, I don't say alif lam meem harf. I'm not saying that this word alif lam meem or this construct alif lam meem is a letter, but I mean alif. Harf, walam, harf, wa mean harf, which means every time he says Allahu Akbar, 
Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. What, look at the reward I'm getting. Y'all see that? So this is another incentive for us to what? To give? To do this da'wah. Another incentive is that da'wah, the good of it and the reward for it in the hereafter is better than the best, the best material wealth a person can think of in this world. The Prophet said in the hadith, he said, he said, لَأَنْ يَهْدِيَ اللَّهُ بِكَ رَجُلًا وَاحِدًا خَيْرٌ لَكَ مِنْ حُمَرٍ مِنْ حُمْرَ النَّعْمِ He said that Allah would guide through you. One person would be better for you than the best red camels. And that's like saying nowadays a fleet of Rolls Royces, a fleet of I don't know, Teslas, I don't know, one of these like really expensive cars, right? That's basically what the Prophet is saying. Better, than, better for you than the best wealth you can imagine, it would be better for you if one person was to be guided on your hands. And last but not least, and again, like I said, this is a tip of the iceberg, I just want to mention a few things to show you the virtue, the merit, the excellence of calling to Allah. Is that the people who call to Allah are going to be successful in this world and in the in the hereafter, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلْتَكُمْ مِنْكُمْ أُمَّةٌ يَدْعُونَ الْخَيْرِ وَيَأْمُرُونَ بِرَحْمُ وَيَأْمُرُونَ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَيَنْحَوْنَ الْمُنْكَرِ وَأُولَيْكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ He says, And let there arise out of you a people who call to goodness. They command or they enjoin what is right, they forbid what is wrong, and those people, they are the ones who are going to be successful. And we all want to be successful. Allah is telling us the path, the path to success by giving da'wah. Last thing I want to mention before we try to close enough time to have some discussion and some questions if there might be any, is that who should give da'wah? People typically think of da'wah in the context of the learned people, the specialists, the people who have official training in the field of da'wah, the imams, the shaykhs, the du'at, etc. But the fact of the matter is that da'wah is a communal responsibility. It's something that all the Muslims are expected to do in accordance with their capacity. And the entire community is supposed to what? Or, I'm sorry, let me say it like this. A sufficient number of people from the community are supposed to engage in it. And if, and if a sufficient number of people engage in it, then the rest of the people who don't engage in it won't be sinful. But if not enough people engage in it, all the people, in the community will be sinful. Well, you do leave that, and this is evidenced by the ayah that we mentioned previously. And let there arise from amongst you a community, a group. Prophet Allah is saying, there's, there needs to be a sufficient amount of people doing this work. Right? And if you don't have a sufficient amount of people, then it's, there's a problem. We also have... Um, the hadith of Bukhari on the authority of Abdullah ibn Amr in which the Prophet said He said convey from me what you've heard even if it is a single sentence which means you don't have to be an expert you don't have to be a credentialed trained specialist in Islamic evangelism no you just need to, te to say what you know and stop there. So I know Allah is one. I know the Quran is true. I know the Messenger Muhammad salam, is truly the Messenger of Allah. You say that. Somebody asks you something that's beyond your capacity, you don't say anything. But you, you say what you know. And sometimes giving da'wah can be as easy as giving a pamphlet, giving a flyer, doing what, you, what you're capable of. But we shouldn't just sit back and not do anything. And there's some implications of the hadith, I just want to mention those ala ujala. One is that the Prophet said, بَلِّهُ عَنِّي This word بَلِّهُ is an imperative, convey. It's an imperative, it's a command. And a command from the Prophet indicates obligation. It indicates that he expects us to do this, and if we don't do it, 
there will be consequences. If it's an obligation, it makes it an act of worship, an act of taqarrub, an act of devotion. Because Allah said in the Hadith, in the Qudsi Hadith, وَمَا تَقَرَّبَ إِلَيَّ عَبْدِي بِشَيْءٍ أَحَبَّ إِلَيَّ مِمَّا افْتَرَفْتُ عَلَيْهِ That my servant doesn't draw closer to me with anything more beloved by me than something I've obligated. Which means that when Allah and His Messenger obligate something, it's an act of what? Taqarrub. It's something that will draw us close to Him, it's an act of worship. So da'wah is an act of worship. Tayyip is an act of worship, then that means that there's a specific way it's supposed to be done. There's specific guidelines. Because every act of worship has what? Has principles, has guidelines, has prerequisites for its acceptance and validity. Is that so? Every act of worship. And we know this because the Prophet said in the Hadith said, مَنْ عَمِلَ عَمْلَ لَيْسَ عَلَيْهِ أَمْنَا فَهُوَا رَدْ Whoever does an act of worship and we have not prescribed it or does it in a way other than the way we prescribed, it will be rejected. He also said, Sallu kama ra'aytumuni usalli, pray as you see me pray. I mean, don't pray however you feel, but pray the way you see me pray, follow these guidelines. And he said, Khudu anni manasikakum. He said, take from me your rights of hedge. So what that teaches us when the Prophet tells us or makes an act of worship, it means, hey, he expects us to conduct our business in a certain way and with certain parameters. And so that means it's incumbent upon all of us who want to do this work to learn the proper way to give da'wah, to call to Allah. And inshallah ta'ala, that will be our next discussion next week. We're going to talk about some of those parameters and guidelines. How do we give da'wah? Uh, what should we do? What should we not do? Etc. That'll be our discussion. I just want to make a couple of announcements before we open the floor for any questions or comments. Uh, the first uh, comment is obviously, um, as you all know, we've mentioned a few times here that we have the da'wah initiative at the flea market. And we go uh, pretty much every Saturday. And we try to be out there for anywhere between two and three hours uh, every uh, weekend, uh, or every Saturday, I should say. And it, the, the imam really wants the community to own this and to actively participate in this initiative. And I was told to convey to the community that if there's not a, su a sufficient enough, of, I'm sorry, a sufficient number of people who will volunteer that this initiative could be canceled or abandoned. We'll just give up. We'll take, we'll take a message from the community that you don't want this, you're not interested in this, and so we'll just give it up. Now that might seem like, okay, well, we'll just give it up. Okay. Some people might actually take that approach. But you also have to understand, and I want you to think about this, and you guys are smart enough to understand what I'm trying to say, is that if the community sends the message that we don't care about these initiatives, we don't care about these programs, then there's no need for the resources that have been dedicated for those programs. I think y'all understand what I'm trying to say. I hope y'all understand what I'm trying to say because I'm dealing with some very intelligent people. That resources have been dedicated for these programs. And if the community sends a message that we couldn't care less about these programs, then why are the resources being spent for these programs? Why are human resources being provided for these programs? Can't make it no clearer than that. I really can't. But um, the next thing I want to mention is um, September 5th. Mark your calendars. That is a Sunday. <laughs> September 5th, uh, a group, um, that, that blood drive bus is going to come and park here in the parking lot, and they're going to be parked there from 10 to 3 p.m. and invite people to donate blood. And so the, the masjid, because of the high-profile location of the masjid, its strategic location, it was identified as a spot that they would like to hold this event. And the Imam Jazallah Khair and welcomed them to hold the event. But obviously he doesn't want all these non-Muslims to come and donate blood on the masjid grounds and no one tells them anything about Islam. And so basically what the Imam would like to do and would like to see is a dawah table uh, and also some refreshments, which means we're going to need some volunteers. If there's some sisters who are interested in volunteering, uh, and even brothers who are interested in volunteering, they can email, email me at brunsaudi.iccprograms uh, at gmail.com. brunsaudi.iccprograms at gmail.com. Email me, let me know you're interested, you want to work on the table, 
Do you want to provide refreshments? If so, what, profess what refreshments would you provide? Uh, we were just thinking like uh, some small like uh, cookies and stuff like that and some lemonade and water, something like that. Not anything you know extravagant. Uh, and again, that is going to begin at 10 a.m. and continue to 3 p.m. from 10 to 3. So what we could do if we plan appropriately, because it's likely to be hot, we could have one of those, those nice little like uh, pavilions that they put up, the, the makeshift pavilion you put up, put some tables so the people who are at the table, uh, manning the table, are in the shade. And then we'll have some refreshments out there as well. And we can talk about the details later, but I just want to put this in your, in your mind, that this is something that will be going on September 5th on a Sunday from 10 to 3 p.m. And we'll need volunteers for both refreshments and for to man the table. But last but not least, uh, some of you might have seen that there was posted in the group uh, this morning, uh, there was a message about uh, the, trying to plan for a community gathering that would uh, consist of kind of merging two initiatives, two ideas. Uh, one idea was to have a community gathering, a dinner, and the other one was to have a type of sleepover and try to revive the spirit uh, of the camp. And those two were basically, the suggestion was made that those two be merged, and an announcement went out for that, and, the, and there was a solicitation or your feedback was solicited. So if you didn't see that message, it is critically important for you to lend your voices in discussion. Go back, look at the message, and give your honest opinion about what you think. Would you like to see the event as advertised? Would you like to see just the community dinner, which is going to be done outside? Say your piece, because the imam wants to hear your feedback. And with that... Uh, I'll uh, close my mouth and give you an opportunity to um, ask any questions, make any comments, or um, offer any discussions that you guys want to, to pose. Uh, Tafadali. Wa alaikum. Wa alaikum. Salaam alaikum. So you, you read from the text about Ibn Taymiyyah. Yes. 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 Could you repeat that text again? Yes. 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 Yes.
right? It, it contradicts the, the, the clear evidence from the, from, from, from the, from the sunnah. Uh, also, um, we talked about calling to, your, calling to Allah and to the aqidah that Allah has prescribed as opposed to calling to an aqidah that, you, that suits your fancy, right? And if you read the book that is very commonly uh, used and promoted by Jamaat Tablir, you'll find uh, in that book, uh, which is, is called uh, Tablir in Yisab, you'll find in that book certain things that go against the aqidah of Islam, the aqidah of the Prophet brought in Allah prescribed. So these are just a few things I could mention, we can mention more next week, that show that, yeah, that their path is not the path of calling to Allah, as the Prophet, as the Prophet, as, as the Prophet was told to say by Allah, Right? That's another thing too, knowledge. That they're lacking in that. In fact, they downplay the importance of knowledge. They downplay the importance, they belittle the importance of, of knowledge, of actively knowing before you speak. They downplay that. And in many cases, they speak without, without knowledge. What the Prophet said, or was told to say, say, this is my path, I call to Allah, not to me or not to aqeed of my own making. Ala basira, upon sound knowledge. Meaning I don't speak except based upon knowledge. Tayyip, ah, tafadli. Oh, yeah, I was just going to say that the Prophet said, Ala basira, upon Which one? Ooh, I don't know what that is. Where did I mention it? Do you remember where I mentioned it? In what context I mentioned it? Yes. Yeah, somebody's been... Dawa. Who, who should give Dawa? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Understood. Allah and Mustan. I don't, I'm not really sure what, what I said, and that doesn't sound like something that uh, somebody's been getting on me, and may Allah reward that brother who's been getting on me. He says I use a lot of terminology, and I don't say what it needs, and I need to work on that. And I, I'm asking everybody in the audience, if I say a word in Arabic, you don't know what it means, stop me right then and say, what does that mean? So I can go ahead. Because we have to get better at that. You know, I mean, we're trying to teach and, and grow and, and, and build each other. And that's a part of it, the linguistic part of it, you know, knowing these terminologies, etc. And, and so I have to do a better job of, um, of saying what those things mean in, con in, in real time. Yeah. You're welcome. Play any other question? I have a question. Ah, uh, Tafadali. Wa'alaikum salam. Is it uh, any circumstance that it might be better not to give da'wah? Let's say if somebody might reject the information or, I don't know, maybe make a joke out of it. Is is there a time that you maybe wouldn't do it? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, if the harm, and this can't be something which is purely speculative, but if you have reason to believe, strong reason to believe that the harm of giving da'wah outweighs the benefit. So, for example, you could give da'wah and you could be violently assaulted. Uh, you could give da'wah and Allah or His Messenger of the Religion of Islam might be cursed. Then, yeah, you wouldn't give da'wah in that circumstance if you were completely confident or largely confident that that's what would be the result or the consequence. But again, that can't be speculative. And we know that this is the case because the Prophet ﷺ, he said, He said, do not put down, do not belittle the idols of the idolaters. And in turn, they'll do what? Put down and belittle Allah without knowledge. So obviously to say it's to say it's foolish to worship idols. Is it that is that wrong? No. Is that not Islamic? It's, it is Islamic. But Allah told the believers, a hey, abandon this approach because it could lead to what? Greater harm. You guys see that? So the same thing is true if a person uh, had reason to believe, strong reason to believe that if I give da'wah in this circumstance, I'm gonna be 
violently uh, assaulted. Or these people are going to curse Allah, curse His Messenger, curse the religion of Allah. He has reason to believe that, then yeah, you, you, you don't give doubt. But what we can do is sometimes you're at work and you're dealing with, for example, a non-Muslim and you're afraid that that person is not going to listen and maybe say something rude about you. Not about Islam, not about the Prophet, not about the thing, they're going to say something rude about you. Or they're not going to talk to you anymore. They're going to stop, they're going to start dissociating with you and maybe even tell other people, hey, this sucks. Hey, stay away from her or him because he's like a religious fanatic. And you want to get along with everybody. So you don't tell them about Islam because you want to get along with them. Would that be an acceptable excuse? No. no, that wouldn't be an acceptable excuse. Babe, uh, any other questions? Going once, because it'll be time for Maghrib uh, shortly. Going once. Ah, it's Fadlan Habib. Can you take one of your words and phrases and give a meaning to it? Yeah, sure. You have you have one in your mind or? Al Muhim. Al Muhim. Yeah, I do say that a lot. Alhamdulillah. Yeah. But Al Muhim, it means um, so like more importantly or. Back to the point. In, in this context, when we say al-muhim, we mean like back to the point, like coming back from a digression. But al-muhim literally means it literally means right. It literally means I oh, used to digress a lot. Thank you for just beating me down today, brother. So uh, so al-muhim, uh, we in that context we usually mean like coming back from digression, you know. But al-muhim literally means the important thing, or more importantly, right? More important. Uh, another one that we say a lot is ahsent. Ahsent means you've done well. So sometimes I'll ask somebody something in the audience and they'll say such and such and they'll say the right thing. I'll say ahsent, you have done, you've done well. Sometimes uh, I'll ask someone something in the audience and, and they'll respond appropriately and I'll say mumtaz. It means what? That's excellent. That's perfect. That's spot on. Ah, it's fadali Wa alaikum Okay. <laughs> yeah, that, that's common. We don't have to like them to call them. We don't have to like them to call them. So what I would say is that sometimes, and this is, I, and trust me, I've been there, done that, to have some neighbors that they are just awful. But if you, want, if you want to ask me what we're expected to do as Muslims, we're expected to call them. And sometimes that's difficult for us to make ourselves do the right thing. But it, that's just like any other thing in Islam. Well, are we giving down with the sisters when we come out in our bars, we behave well? That's a type of that's we're respectful. That's a type of da'wah. But if that were sufficient, the Prophet wouldn't have called anybody. He would have just practiced Islam. So it's a type of da'wah, but that's not where we're supposed to stop. So I know it can be tough when you have neighbors who are awful. Uh, and sometimes neighbors can be abusive and sometimes they're abusive passive aggressively but again what we're expected to do is to try uh, and if we don't do that it's like any other thing sometimes it's hard sometimes you say man forget that but we shouldn't do that we shouldn't so we're talking about the ideal what we're expected to do is even call those people even call those people and I know it's not easy but that's what we're expected to do yeah <laughs> or move huh? you said just move huh all right, so with that, we'll, uh, we'll bring today's session to Ah, Muhammad, yeah. Ah, Tumma Ba'da Dalek. Okay, and then after that. Okay. and then after that. Yeah, and then after that, right? Or on to the next thing, basically. On to the next thing. Yeah. Tayyip, Hadha wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak wa Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'i. Barak wa Oh, my God.